CEO of Tritons. Uh, we're an IT effectiveness and user adoption consulting company, and we help make sure that when organizations are rolling out new um, technologies and new business processes and change programs, such as a, a wellness program, that people use it and, and actually get full value from it. Um, we're delighted to have our presenter today, Emily Richards, the CEO of Sade Wellness, and Emily will introduce herself in just a couple minutes. Um, just to let you know, this program is part of the speaker series that we've done. We did an earlier session on the business case for wellness programs. If you haven't seen it yet, um, it is available on the Tritons uh, YouTube channel, and I believe Emily has a link to it on the Sade Wellness website as well, too. Um, Emily shared a lot of great information in that presentation and would encourage you to check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Um, so with that said, Emily, do you want to quickly just do a quick introduction? Uh, yes, Jason, thank you so much um, for allowing us the, the opportunity to co-present with you today. Uh, as Jason said, I'm Emily Richards, founder of Saudi Wellness. We provide a comprehensive wellness solution tool to corporations, both small, mid-market, all the way up to Fortune uh, 250 size. And we pride ourselves in the ability to come in and actually create a soup to nuts offering so that we basically alleviate the um, alleviate the additional pressure or burden of an HR team's uh, plate to set up uh, an effective and robust wellness program. And so hopefully throughout today's discussion you'll be able to identify areas in your own firms um, that you might be able to improve upon within your existing wellness program or if you don't have one perhaps some, some tips to help get you started. Great. So um, for today's presentation, we're going to, Emily and I will take turns presenting some things. Um, what we do ask that if you have any questions or you'd like to, to um, share any information or things like that, if you could chat it out to the organizer, to me, Jason Whitehead, and then at the end of the presentation, um, I'll forward all the questions and, and read them out to Emily and she'll go back and, and share any information. Um, we've had a lot of great questions in the past and we hope that you won't be shy, so we'll go ahead and get started then. So. Um, Emily, so our agenda today, we're going to talk a little bit about why wellness programs, and then um, we'll talk a bit about the strategy and structure of the programs, and that's both from a, a business and organizational perspective of if you decide you're implementing out a program, um, how do you take from having no program at all to actually defining what you need in your program, and, and then who in your organization or externally will help you um, actually go ahead and implement it. And then we'll talk some um, key employee organizational issues, and then really, Emily will spend quite a bit of time helping to educate us on how do you find the right um, wellness program content for your organization and figure out what it's the right mix of things that you can do um, to help improve wellness all the way through. So Emily, do you want to uh, kick us off here? Absolutely. Thanks, Jason. So this is a slide that actually was shared in our original presentation or the first the first presentation with regard to the case for workplace wellness but the the numbers are so impactful that we wanted to, pre to present them again and it, it's a staggering statistic that if Americans quit smoking ate healthily and exercised 80 percent of diabetes 40 percent of cancer and 80 percent of heart disease and stroke would be able to be prevented or eliminated and that translates to 75 percent of all disease being preventable by diet and exercise we have an epidemic that is currently sweeping the country, and it's estimated that by 2020, if we don't get the, our health care spending under, under control, um, if we aren't able to manage and eliminate disease, we're going to be spending over $4 trillion on health care. Another staggering statistic is that companies, at the end of the day, are spending 60% of their after-tax profits on health care costs of an organization. So this is a huge burden to a company. If it's not on a company's radar, it should be. And we have proven ways to implement a program and, and put into place within your own organization that can help decrease some of these staggering statistics. On average, uh, cost to a U.S. employer per year per employee is, is $1,685. And that's directly a, a number that's directly correlated to health-related productivity costs productivity losses. Uh, we're able to identify our return on investment with a wellness program in two ways, both with direct and indirect costs. And I'll, and I'll get into that in a bit more in a moment. Uh, the, the direct costs are, are easy to quantify. Obviously, if an individual is, 
ill, meaning that they're absent, or if there is a claim for an illness or disease that has been filed with the, within their insurance, within the insurance claim. But the indirect costs that include loss of productivity and presenteeism, being present but not, but not truly engaged, is a huge, huge cost to employers that often is, is, a, is a sleeping cost that they aren't able to quantify and they have no idea just how impactful it really is to their bottom line. So what are some of the benefits of workplace wellness? Well, obviously it lowers health healthcare costs so that the claims are reduced with a healthier workforce. Also with disability costs, uh, short-term and long-term disabilities are a drainer to a company's uh, bank account. Um, another huge, uh, particularly growing concern is workman's compensation. We have found that there's a direct correlation with unhealthy indiv individuals filing workman's compensation claims they can they can uh, quadruple they can they can multiply tenfold if an individual is unhealthy um, so when companies come to us typically they have two main concerns they have high health care claims costs and they have high workman's compensation claims um, but in addition to that it, as I mentioned in the, the prior slide it enhances employee productivity it reduce, reduces absenteeism the overall employee and culture of an organization is enhanced significantly with a healthier population. Uh, with regard to retention, we are finding that millenniums that are coming out of school, they care less about a six-figure income in a corner office. They want to know more about what a company is doing for their life balance. Um, this is a, a, great, a great way to attract the best talent coming out of school. And it's also a great way to retain top talent that you've cultivated and you've poured time, effort, and energy into establishing within your company. And then it also in increases the organizational commitment and creation of a culture of health. Um, it's pretty, it, it, it can be pretty um, black and white when we walk into a company. We can identify the culture outright and then the, the individual's health of the people that work within that company are a direct correlation to that, to that culture. For the employees, obviously it enhances their well-being, their self-image, their self-esteem. It helps them cope better with stress and other factors of affecting their health. Um, a healthier body is a clearer mind and with greater clarity increases the productivity. It also creates a safe and more supportive work environment. Obviously decreases the acute health, uh, health issues and then the corresponding cost to the, to the individual after, um, after their claims are filed and then the lower out-of-pocket costs. And then increases access to health promotion and resources, and it also improves their job satisfaction. Healthy employees are happy employees, and happy employees typically stay longer at an organization. These are a couple of statistics that we like to show, as I mentioned earlier, about the workman's compensation. Uh, this was a study that was done by a wellness solutions um, company in which they looked at the savings over the course of three years in three main areas, workman's compensation, absenteeism, and then medical claims costs. And you can see that the to total savings year over year increased significantly based on the number of years that the wellness program has been in place. So we are very, we are very forthright in setting an expectation that the first year or so it, you will be able to see a return on investment for, for the wellness program that you implement, but what you're going to see, the longer you have it in place, the greater the, greater the savings and the, the more obvious the savings will be, both in the claims, the workman's compensation, absenteeism, retention. And so this is, we like to say this is a journey, not a race. So if you're, if you're looking for a quick off-the-shelf product for a quick, quick fix, a Band-Aid, um, you're not going to find it in, in effective programs that, that really do impact the bottom line. So, so when we recommend when you're looking for a program, ensure that there is, there is a component in which you can actually see lifestyle modifications and behaviors change over time versus just let's check the box and, and say that we have a wellness program in place. And Emily, if I recall correctly, um, when we presented this last week, there was quite a bit of discussion around, too, the, some companies wanted to start with pilot programs. Um, just to see where they go, but you know, to your point, that that a one-year pilot or two-year pilot probably won't get you the big lift, but it's going to, to come a little bit later. So you're trying to encourage people if you're thinking about a program, 
to stick with it for at least three or four years to really start to see when things kick in because there's that, that big incremental lift at the end. Absolutely. And, and the whole mentality, crawl before you walk, walk before you run. There, the introduction for, for year one might just be simply education. It might be one spoke of, of the wellness wheel that we have um, or a company has. Because sometimes throwing too much at one time to an organization or employee base that, that we've identified as having little to no understanding of health and wellness is, is not really effective. They become overwhelmed. We see their eyes glaze over and we know that we've lost them. So, so with that approach, then it, then it certainly is a longer build cycle rather than just one year implementing and, and we're all healthy. This is just another statistic that you can see that a significant amount of studies were done on uh, taking this a step further with identifying the actual ROI that's associated with the medical costs, absenteeism, and workman's compensation. And you can see that there is a, if you can run the numbers yourself. Based on these average, you do a plug and play. Take this num one of these numbers and put it into your organization per employee and see what your return is. And the larger the organization, obviously, the larger impact these savings have to your bottom line. Okay. Great. So um, now to jump in a little bit from the strategy and structure of, of planning out a, a wellness program, trying to figure out how to get started and, and how to get all the different moving parts to work well together. I'm going to talk a little bit about this, and then um, we've got some more details coming up later. So basically, the, the first part from a wellness program that we've seen is really trying to figure out from a strategy perspective, what are your goals and what is it you're trying to achieve? Um, a lot of companies and organizations will say, you know, we want healthy employees, we want, we want to, you know, save money on health care costs, whatever, but they don't really get into the detail of well, what does that actually look like and mean um, specifically and figure out what are the specific pieces you're going to aim for and over what time frame. Um, and when we go through to help organizations figure out their strategy and their goals, we, um, especially for wellness, you need to look at it from two perspectives. One, the perspective of the organization that will be funding the program and making decisions about um, how they want it to fit within their organization. And then two, also looking at what are the goals for the employees themselves um, and what is it from their perspective and trying to blend in a program that meets both of those angles. Um, once you sort of figure out what you need to do, not surprising, figure out a needs assessment, which is really identifying where you are both as an organization and, and as an employee base um, and figuring out, okay, well, here's our starting point. Here's our goals. What's the delta? And then putting together a roadmap for moving forward to say, what do we do first, and what timeline, and who needs to do it, and how do we get there? Um, and we'll come to all these in a little bit more detail. Uh, <coughs> so I think this covers, at a high level, what we just talked about. One of the areas that I think where organizations struggle, and we'll talk um, in the next section around this too, is really coming up with how will you measure your success and when. Um, you know, I've consistently worked with organizations where like, well, we want to improve wellness, we want to, you know, save money. Well, give me the specifics. You know, what is the specific thing that you're going to measure? Where's that information going to come from? And that's when you'll know that you're hitting your goals or not. And that's when you can start to measure your return on investment piece. Um, one of the other things that, that we often look at is trying to figure out what are the drivers that are going to make you successful? Um, and they could be, you know, within the, the individuals or it could be within your organization. And then also, what are the barriers that will prevent people from adopting a wellness program or, or a health and healthy, well-balanced well lifestyle? And sometimes when you look at what are the things that prevent people, you'll find that there are things that are outside the individual's control that you might be able to change. Um, and some of these might be um, organizational related. So do they have time to participate in wellness activities? Um, you know, do their managers give them the freedom to do that? Do they have the information they need? Things of that nature. So trying to identify both what's going to encourage people and what are the areas to, that will prevent them. And then once you've found those, one of the questions I always get is, well, do we start by trying to work on the positives and increase drivers or remove barriers? And one of the things that's been effective from an organizational change perspective is really saying, well, let's start by removing barriers first and then make sure we're, we're encouraging the drive. Um, now we're going to take a, a little bit of a deeper dive, and this is, okay, you've got your strategy um, in terms of what you're trying to achieve, and you've got your objectives. How do you actually go about implementing it in your organization? 
what are the steps you need to do, what are the, the skills and roles and responsibilities you need to have, what are the resources you need to really go from here's our goal to here's success. Um, so one of the first things you need to do is really figure out and kick off your program and that might be working with your executive team and leaders to say here's what it is, here's what we're doing, here's the resources we have available, here's what we're looking for. And then if you're with a large organization, and I've worked with um, rolling out change programs to large government organizations where it's you know, hundreds of thousands of people on multiple sites, um, you're going to need um, representatives from the local organizations. You're going to need a team together to help deliver some of your change efforts and activities. In this case, if you're rolling out a wellness program, you, know, you will also need local people to help. There will be people who want to be involved. So you need to figure out who those people are, what it is you want them to do, how you're going to communicate to them, and then really um, what are the specific actions you want them to take. So that's sort of a, um, the program onboarding is figuring out who and what we want to do, how we're going to roll out our program. Um, and then the next piece, Emily, if you can talk to this a little bit um, about the biometric screening yeah. and the ongoing engagement, we can talk about this. Sure. So the biometric screening, a, a, couple, a couple of things. First, when we go into an organization, we say that we can provide 90% of our offering virtually. And we, we truly can. The, the difference in, in what we can provide virtually versus in person does change a little bit when it comes to biometric screening. We can conduct a health risk assessment virtually, which identifies the low, moderate, and high risk of an organization. But with biometric screening, obviously, we have to have an in-person facilitating that, that screening. We, have, we initially partnered with a, a large uh, firm that actually did the screening for us. We were finding that it was incredibly cost prohibitive, and we felt that there really were 10 to 12 indices that really identified whether or not an individual was in need of, of do A, doctor's care, and B, we, we were able to assess their health to determine whether or not they needed to, to participate in our program. And more times than not, the answer was that they did need to at least participate. Um, so what we, in, in a perfect scenario, what we like to do is we like to go in and conduct the biometric screening first. Uh, this comes before any of the other program aspects or elements are implemented. And the reason why we do this is we like to be able to come to the company and say, here are the aggregated results. Now granted, we can only go to the company with the aggregated results if we have more than 40 participants due to HIPAA compliance. But when we, are, when we do have that, that 40 life, threshold. We go to them and say, okay, here, here are the where the red flag areas are. And based on these red flag areas, here are the goals that we've created for this first year. And, and we show them how and where we're going to move, move the needle based on the, this biometric screening. Now, if we, in similar, for, in similar we can do, do the same with health, the health risk assessment. Now, if we don't do the biometric screening, then we can still set goals, but it's, still, it's a little less quantifiable just based on the fact that we don't have the hard numbers from the screening. Um, once those screening results and the goals have been set, we then do an onboarding process in which we roll out with a full communication plan to in ensure that there's high engagement, there's, the momentum is, is created, and the communication is implemented to sustain that engagement long term. And those that engagement is sustained through activities and continual top of mind um, presentation of, of what the program offers. And then on an annual basis, we do a full metrics measurement in which the company is given a report that identifies the areas where we were able to improve the, what we would have considered red flags or weaknesses. And we also have the ability to do quarterly measurements, although they're less, they're, they're less um, um, we can measure less on a, on a quantitative basis, and we do more qualitative assessments if, they, if the survey is done quarterly. Great. Um, you know, one of the things, as I'm listening to that, I wanted to throw out as well, um, when we look about employee engagement and ongoing engagement activities, again, it's important to remember there's multiple audiences here, but there's really the engagement of the employees and the participants in the wellness program um, to actually help drive their desired behavior and their wellness activities. But there's also engaging employees around the business and organizational side of a wellness program. And we'll talk some more about some, what those business decisions look like and, and where you need to engage people. But it is important to remember that you know, for a successful wellness initiative, you need to have that 
executive support and manager support as well too for funding the program and conducting it and showing that it is a, a, an added benefit to the organization and you need to engage people on that level as well too. So moving forward then, when you actually go to roll out the programs, what does it look like from a, how do we chunk up the work and the activities and, and um, taking this into to the active mode? And we've come up with sort of four key areas. Um, one, there's the, the health and wellness activities themselves, and that is really the bulk of what Emily's um, company and expertise provides is, you know, if you need biometric screening, if you need wellness activities, if you need exercise, and whatever it may be, and Emily will talk more about those options later, um, that's one piece is the, the content itself. Um, then the employee engagement, as we talked about, is how do you socialize people? How do you not only just communicate out to them, but also listen to them and involve them in the process so that they are more committed to it for themselves and more likely to change their own behavior, um, both for changing behavior and participation in the wellness program, but also in the organizational and, and business side of it. And then the other piece of organizational goals, policies, and metrics, um, what I'll talk about next is there are a lot of business and, and policy decisions that will influence both the way you roll out your program, the funding and ROI implications, and the options that you give people around it. And there's a lot of those decisions that you need to make early on and then communicate out to people. And then all of this is supported by an ongoing level of program management um, that has to continue out throughout the program. And some of that's logistical, some of it's dealing with issues and risk, some of it's dealing with questions that came up. Um, but it, there is that ongoing piece that, that someone's got to support the program and keep it going. So organizational employee issues. Um, when we talk about business goals, here's some areas that we said financial, productivity, HR. Um, there's a whole piece there of really what are the specific goals and metrics that you're trying to achieve and how do you prioritize those? Um, you know, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. And trying to say these are what's most important for our, our organization is absolutely critical. And then you'll want to commun communicate these out to everyone and say this is why we're doing the program. Here's what we're looking to achieve and here's how we're going to get there. <laughs> um, Wellness-related policies. You know, there's a lot of discussions around do we do opt-in and opt-out. Um, uh, so, for example, there's some places that say, you know, you must have biometric screenings if you want us to subsidize your health insurance. And, and I uh, know of companies that they started out with, it was an option for company, for employees to have biometric screening. It was delivered as a perk. And then they actually made it mandatory, and they would give people time off to do it. Um, so those are some of the decisions and example decisions. Um, Another option would be we don't hire people who smoke. Um, there are organizations who do that. Uh, there were also cases out in the Midwest of, uh, I believe it was a hospital company that uh, fired a handful of employees because they would not have a flu shot, and they felt that, that these employees um, who were refusing the, fu fuel sh uh, <coughs> excuse me, the flu shot were endangering the lives of their patients, so they made the policy decision to get rid of them. Um, and then there's also decisions about do you need to have time off as outside of work to participate in this? Uh, of course, that's you know, part of your job, and they'll give you time to do that. So there's a whole slew of what is the organizational areas that we need to think about and the touch points here. Um, and then some metrics of who, who you're going to track, whose job is it to, to put them together, and who, um, who's going to make decisions with these. So if you're looking to have an executive committee that's going to oversee the program, um, letting them know, hey, here are the executives in charge. Here's the information we're going to provide you. Here are the decisions and recommendations we're going to ask you to make, um, and how all that that whole process will work. And then another key area, and this ties into the engagement piece, is who's going to be accountable for making sure that um, people are adopting the one. <coughs> Many times, you can actually get some great results by saying, "Hey, you know, each department will have to." report up on their wellness activity um, and if they're achieving goals. And it could be as simple as telling each supervisor, you need to put this as a line item on your team meeting once a week or once a month. Or it could be even things such as uh, super, letting supervisors know it's expected that they should give employees time off to go to the gym. Um, I worked with an organization a few years ago where there was a small team and two of the gentlemen who were there wanted to go to the gym over their lunch hour and then just eat, eat lunch at their desk and they were just going to need like an extra 10 or 15 minutes um, that they would make up at the end of the day, just changing their schedule. They weren't looking for additional time off. For whatever reason, an individual supervisor did not like this, so he prevented them from doing it. And it wasn't until that supervisor was replaced that 
they were able to do this. And it was kind of interesting because the, um, the employees who were not allowed to go at first, their morale was awful, their productivity was awful. All the things that Emily pointed towards about the, the benefits of wellness, as um, soon as they were allowed to do this small little adjustment of schedule, um, their, employee, their morale shot up, their productivity shot up, and they were generally more productive and they stayed later and put in extra effort. So there really were some perks there, um, but it was tied to that organizational policy change. <coughs> so talking about employee engagement, um, it really, engagement is not the same as communications. And if people come in and say you just need to communicate, communicate, um, they may want to rethink their approach a little and figure out, well, how do we go beyond just telling people? And how do we go beyond just sharing information? Um, when I try and view employee engagement, it's sort of like getting people to, getting everyone in the organization to make the same New Year's resolution and then stick with it in perpetuity. And how do you get people to change their behavior and share their opinion and really, really get on with it? Um, and just, just sharing messages and telling them how great they will feel probably won't get you there. But organizing things where they're involved, where they have to build out their own program, where they come up with the techniques to support themselves, and where they have you know, authority and responsibility for doing so and having someone check, um, that's a better way to go. <coughs> um, there's a, a lot of things you can do. Uh, an example that we talked about, if you were trying to engage people on the business side, and get uh, internal support for your program. Um, you know, it's very easy to come up with a great report, and it's very easy to ask one person, you know, in a short time, give me the answer to these questions. An alternative approach is to do things like get a handful of people in the room who need to be involved and who support you need, facilitate a, a whiteboard session or discussion session where they're coming up with the answers themselves, um, and then capture that information on flip charts and share it out so people have a visual display of the activities that were involved in the effort that people are putting in, they can go and ask questions, um, actually is a much more effective tool. So um, a lot of times when people are looking at organizations that say, hey, what's the fastest and most efficient way to get this information done? But sometimes they say, hey, we'll take a little more time, but we'll get acceptance and engagement and buy-in, they'll be tenfold in value. Um, when we actually talk about adoption of your program, here's uh, just a couple things from to consider. From the, the business side, many times it's, you know, we come in, we set our business goals, we invest in a program, and we expect these great results. And that's sort of the people who are making funding decisions about the wellness program, that's kind of the process they take when they do it from the perspective of what's the best thing for the organization. <coughs> Excuse me. When you actually look at from the participant and the employee, like, okay, well, what are my goals? What do I want to get out of this? Um, do I have the opportunities to do it? For example, can I take time over lunch? Do I, will it be on site? Will, is it easy? Um, or is it something where, because of my schedule and, and my situation, I really can't participate even if I wanted to? And then, okay, so now I'll go ahead. I've got the opportunity. I actually go and do it. And then I, I stick with it because um, I'm sure we've all been in a situation where we try something new, but then it fades out after a few weeks or a few months. How do we make sure we stick it because wellness is a life commitment? And then actually achieve our goals. And so there's a couple of different processes. But where it gets interesting is when you say, hey, people are not adopting the program or they're not sticking with it, then they're not achieving their goals. And if the employees don't achieve their goals, the organization's not going to achieve theirs either. And they are kind of... Um, linked in that way, then you really can't get away from this. So when you're talking with people about, hey, how do we make sure we get engagement? Why is it worth the effort in these activities? Why do we want to spend the money? Um, it's because it's absolutely critical and to your success and it's on the critical path. And if you don't get the adoption and sustain it, um, neither the individual nor the organization will achieve their goals. Uh, Emily, do you want to talk about this a bit? Yes, that'd be great. So playing off of the engagement of, of Jason, what you talked about, the importance of engagement within an organization, really with, with, any, with any process or program that they have in place, it is just as critical with a wellness program. There are several areas that we focus on when we go into a company to create engagement. And the engagement is created in, se in several ways. 
One, it's social engagement, meaning that the, the individual needs to be able to interact with other employees within an organization. And it sounds simple enough, but we've gone into, we've gone into organizations where when you walk through the halls, no one is talking or no one's allowed to talk or there's, there's no form of communication either verbally or, or by, with body language. And quite honestly, there, you, need, you need to have that level of engagement in order to have an effective program. So we encourage social engagement in several ways, obviously through participation together in activities. Through our technology, we have a, a social engagement piece that encourages people to interact with one another. Uh, we, that, so, so engagement, social engagement is, is one of the core offerings that, that must be included within any effective wellness program. And the second is accountability. There are, se there are several ways to, to be held accountable. Obviously, uh, it can be as simple as uh, checking in and participating in a, in a lunch and learn. Also, there's ways for us to create buddy systems so that individuals can have an, an accountability, a one-on-one -on -one accountability with another individual in the office. And then with our technology, we also have push notifications or reminders. And that can range, again, from the activities that are being implemented that day to a daily challenge that they receive every morning when they wake up to take 500 extra steps today or drink an additional two glasses of water. And it's small, it's small things on a daily basis that add up to a long-term lifestyle change. Um, going back to the, to the slide header, technology really does drive our engagement. As I mentioned, there's components to Social, to social engagement and push notifications and buddy systems within our technology and also with our metrics. So we have the ability for the HR admin to have access or whoever is administrator for the wellness program to have access on the back end and actually see real-time progress on aggregated metrics that we measure. Um, they can see the real-time progress on, on qualitative and quantitative measurements. Um, they can see who's attending workplace wellness um, lunch and learns. They can see who's, who's losing weight, um, not who, but how much, uh, because that obviously has to be aggregated. And they can also see and set goals. Um, it, from a personal standpoint as well, the individual through our technology, they have the ability to set goals and see their own personal progress, which is very critical for them to have long-term sustainable engagement. Uh, thanks, Mike. A couple of things just to throw out there as well, too. One of the things that I really like about the way Sade has approached engagement and having these technology tools there is they're very, very helpful for uh, remote um, workforces or you know, high travel occupations or high travel teams to allow people to, to access it um, and get health information at when and where it's convenient for them. You know, as well as the 24-hour component, um, you know, if you're at, at a late night gym or you've had a long day and you still want to be able to check in on your phone, it's really great to be able to do that kind of thing. And, and, and stay on top of your program. Uh, one other little thing around the engagement, just to tie back, the great metrics and change, seeing progress and how that works, um, that is a huge piece for, for sustained behavior piece. And when we've worked with organizations, um, there's usually a lot of questions around, well, who should see information and who shouldn't and how should it get shared? And one of the th things that we've consistently found, um, one, you have to make decisions around that. But it's amazing how just sharing a little bit of information on a regular basis so that people have some sort of way to track or measure progress or if they're falling back by making it easily accessible, visual, um, and, and available to them without any sort of hassle, it, people will check in on it all the time. And you, know, you can publish it, you can share it, you can make it a click away. Um, but it really does help inspire people to be much more aware of the program and to keep it front of mind. Uh, so definitely a, a huge, huge piece to it there. Um, Emily, you know, if I recall correctly, one of the questions that came up at the um, previous discussions as well were that, hey, you know, we're looking at wellness programs and our insurance company has one that they do, um, you know, or, you know, how, how are technology-driven ones different? Or the other piece was, you know, we've got a lot of posters and there was a lot of, um, you know, a couple of emails and things like that, but that didn't really get, get results. Um, how do we make it different? Uh, can you share a little, little bit of insight around that? Sure. So we pride ourselves in saying that we are a turnkey solution, but the reality is, is we're a turnkey solution to the end user, the employer, and the employees. We are 
cu completely customizable in the back end, and it takes a significant amount of work and focus on our on our end to identify what will work best in one company because work, workplace wellness programs are not a one size fit, fits most. Uh, it depends a lot on the culture of an organization. It depends a lot on the demographic. What works for a millennium and motivates a millennium is not going to motivate someone that's five years from retirement. It also is impacted by the level of health and fitness of the of the overall organization. And so these are these are key indicators that we have to look at before we will put a program in place. Um, and so it's very very important for us to be able to. We have our boots on the ground and be able to observe a company before we make recommendations. And typically speaking, we, we have a four-pronged approach, and we the four-pronged approach is in alignment with the Healthy Workforce Act. And the Healthy Workforce Act identifies four key components to an effective program. And they include an HRA biometric screening. The second is activities or behavioral, behavioral movement. The third is education. And the fourth is a rewards incentive program. And so we firmly believe, based on all the research that was, that was compiled in order to get to this four-prong approach, we, we believe that that's, that's the right uh, roadmap in order to have an effective program. But again, if, if your company is new to this, then we might say, OK, this is, the, this is a four-pronged approach that we want to be able to achieve by year three. But we're going to have to start small and build from that. And again, back to the whole crawl before you walk, walk before you run. Um, but going back to, the, to the, the, the question, Jason, that you talked about with insurance companies is that oftentimes insurance companies have a, one, a, a shelf product, a one size fits all. And, and they might even have a portal. A lot of times the portal just has PDFs that individuals can download if they have heart disease or have diabetes, and they have, they'll have a 1-800 helpline or hotline in the, on a poster in a break room if, they have, if they're depressed or if they are in need of some form of financial counseling. Um, EAPs are not, do not replace what we do, preventative wellness, um, not to be confused. But, but we, we truly recommend to, to take it a, a step further um, our, one of our differentiators is that we are, have a very hands-on approach. We get involved within the organization on a on a site-by-site -site basis if, if the budget allows, so that we can ensure that we get that high engagement. Um, we have health coaching. We have virtual health coaching, although we're not we're not going to have a one eight hundred nurse hotline like many insurance providers have, in which whoever you'll call and get whoever is on call. You will you have a dedicated individual that individuals within a company can know by name and can build a relationship with. So we have a, even though we can serve large populations, we have a very intimate approach so that individuals feel that we're, that we're committed to their individual health and they're not just lost in a sea of, of, in, of employees within a large organization. Great, thank you. That's really helpful to hear the differences in approaches and programs and how um, one size doesn't fit all. And J um, Jason, one one thing that I, I want to mention, and, and it, it might not be, I might be jumping the gun here, but one thing that I don't feel a lot of companies are aware of is that by, when 2014 occurs and all of the the reform is put into put into action, it, providers will have the ability to change premiums on on a on a monthly basis or whenever they so choose. So. It, it's no longer are you going to have set premiums, lock-in premiums for a 12-month period of time. You will, you will, companies will be shouldering the risk that their premiums could go up at any time, which further makes the case that having a wellness program and having everyone's health in check will actually minimize a, a, a very large risk if it's, if it's not contained. Wow, I, I didn't know that. That's that's great information. Um, so, so moving on real quick, just want to finally touch about the the last of the the um, organizational structure and things like that. So, for ongoing program management, um, you know, here are just some of the questions and things to think about. Um, who's going to create the program, and how big of an effort and team you need really will just depend on the size and complexity of your organization, both number of participants and locations. 
um, but also you know the complexity and size of your wellness program as well too. Um, rolling out a wellness program to a 30, 40, 50 person company would be very different than rolling one out to a 10,000 or 100,000 employee based organization. Um, and really the level of roles and responsibilities that you would need um, will change. So you know if you have a multi-site location um, with on-site people, you may have a core program team that, that helps define key activities and sends information out to them for them to go and, and execute the activities. Whereas if you're a smaller organization, it may be one, one person doing all of it or, or one or two people doing the bulk of the work. Um, so just trying to figure out who needs to do what. And then really, how do you also incentivize and reward the program team? Um, you know, if they have, I've seen situations where the program team participants may have a day job, and if they are, if all of their performance review and salary information is based on how well they do their day job, um, they have no incentive or they have little incentive for making the, the program, the wellness program successful um, if they're strung out for time and things like that. So you really need to make sure as well that the team is incentivized correctly. Um, then there's obvious things like what is your, your program plan, both from a communications engagement standpoint, from a business ROI standpoint, and from a wellness activities piece as well too. And figure out what are the specific activities and deliverables that you need to make all this stuff happen and come together. Um, tools and infrastructure, just like you would rolling out any program, you know, what are the things that you need to make the program work? Do you need um, dashboards and metrics around wellness? Do you need dashboards and metrics and, and proof around um, tracking your, your business results and your ROI for the organization? Uh, do you have the communications tools and techniques that you need? If you need to send out email blasts or you need websites where people can go to get information or if you need to have um, road shows and all that kind of neat little thing, thinking through what is it you need to do. And then really what does it take to but not just get it set up but also to keep it going. Um, wellness programs, you know, whether it's uh, individual piece or group stuff, uh, it really is something that has to continue on in perpetuity and you need to continually make sure that you have the tools and techniques you need there. Um, here's just a quick example for people who um, aren't familiar with what the program might look like. Uh, this is based on ones that we do when we're helping people adopt technology piece, but a lot of the, the stuff apply. There's specific tracks of how you break up the information. There's specific deliverables, timelines, deadlines, and that kind of stuff. Um, and it easily applies over a lot of wellness programs. Um, so Emily, I want to turn most of this, I think, over to you now to really get into the, the details of what's in the wellness program and what are the specifics to look at. Sure, and I'll, I'll talk quickly to ensure that we have time for a Q&A prior to um, the conclusion of the hour. But a couple of things to consider when you're creating a wellness program. Obviously, consider your employee population. Take into consideration the median age, then also look on to, to both sides of that spectrum of the young and, and the older populations so that you know what you're working with. You can, you can apply a much more... Uh, robust virtual program when it comes to the younger demographic on average and you're typically going to need a more hands-on approach for the older population. Look at the aggregated health as a general rule. Do you, do you have a healthy population? Are they unhealthy? Again, this will dictate or predicate how, how robust of a program you can implement right away. And then look at whether or not you are dealing with primarily a white collar or a blue collar environment or if there's a blend. We treat white collar and blue collar very differently in our approaches is because uh, obviously we can have a more virtual platform with people that are sitting behind a computer all day and all, and quite honestly they're dealing with with uh, more with different issues that can be that that can arise due to sitting at a desk versus someone who is lifting boxes and is and is putting all the weight on their knees because they're not they're not squatting or standing up appropriately and, and quite honestly might not have access to a computer for two to three days at a time. Consider the, the culture. How involved are your employees in your organization now? Is the current culture a, an encouraging culture? Is, is it toxic? If we create healthy employees and put them back in a toxic environment, it's diminishing returns. So the culture really is a critical, compete, critical component to an effective program. And then looking at the C-suite, do, do you have buy-in from all management levels from the top down? We find that if an executive team is on board and participating in the program, you're, the results are tenfold versus an organization where the executive team is just checking the box. And, and then it, it pushes down to all, all levels of management from there. 
And again, particularly the CEO's positioning, is he or she participating in the, the program itself? I mentioned this before, but this is a visual of how of the spokes of our wellness wheel. And these align with the Healthy Workforce Act, and I'll just repeat them quickly. It's a biometric screening and or the health risk assessment, activities, education, and then a rewards or incentive program. And these are the these are the program components. We like to create programs in what we call cluster groups. But when we're looking at a program, this is this is really the skeletal of or the, or the components that we would like to see in a, in a robust program. And they include the biometric screening and or health risk assessment, access to the, our proprietary wellness portal and, and or our wellness app, health coaching virtually obviously is much more cost effective, access to education, we send out a weekly newsletter with small tips to, to, to create very simple basic lifestyle changes. We have, we have weekly lunch and learns that can be streamed if you want a fully virtual program, as well as streamed or on-site fitness classes depending on what your budget or preference may be. And as I mentioned here, the clusters, we, if you're at a crawling phase, we would recommend cluster phase one, the introductory, in which you would have the access to the wellness portal and the smartphone app. Um, in the smartphone app, I can get to that in a little bit, but it, it helps individuals manage their own progress and their own, their own health and wellness. And then the education piece that can include the weekly e-blast as well as in office communications such as posters or flyers if there's, a, if there's room to do so. And then cluster two is for someone who is starting to stand up um, and, and consider walking. And that, again, includes the portal, the smartphone app, the education pieces, and then we also would then layer in monthly lunch and learns for nutrition, exercise, and overall well-being, and then also exercise classes. Cluster three is a bit more advanced, so we're walking now, and that's the portal and the app. Everything that you had before, but we're then layering on the biometric screening to get a much more specific and quantitative ROI. And then cluster four, which is what we really recommend, it's the most robust of programs, and that's where you would layer in your health coaching in addition to all of the other components that you've seen in cluster three. Great. And plan implementation. Well, sure. So for plan implementation, there are several key components. Obviously, communication. We have a full communication 12-month plan in place that we, that we implement once the onboarding has occurred. Uh, we also survey participants throughout the year because if we go down a path and we implement a program, even though it's, it's, a, it's a very calculated approach, if it's, something's not working, we need to stop, sh shift things to make sure that people are engaged in the way that we need, them, we need and want them to engage in order to meet those, those set standards and, and goals. Uh, we measure metrics on an ongoing basis, real time, and then there's an annual, annualized report at the end. Uh, we provide on-site access and presence of our team, again, that hands-on approach. We schedule check-ins with the, our point people or point team at an organization to make sure that all things are, all expectations are being met, all needs are being met, and if there are any concerns are brought up and we are able to address them before they become an issue. And then, as I said, the, obviously the wrap report at the 12-month at the mark. Here are our desired results. Obviously, we want to be able to provide a company aggregated metrics so that they can see a, return, a, a hard cost return on investment. We want to decrease absenteeism. We actually measure the absenteeism, seats and, adapt, or seats and chairs uh, on an annualized basis. Our goal is to reduce claims as well as reduce workman's compensation claims with health care and workman's compensation, increase productivity, and increase employment engagement. This is just a snapshot of some of the metrics we measure when you, when an HR administrator or whoever is assigned the, the role of managing the wellness program internally, and by management meaning just the point person or the facilitator if need be, this is, this is a snapshot of what their, back, their back-end dashboard looks like so that they can see the metrics measured in real time. 
And what I like about this is you've got a combination of metrics both around the employee wellness itself from a screening perspective as well as um, the business organizational metrics of number of sick days, insurance claims, that kind of thing. Um, again, really showing that there are the two, two themes to both, both parts here. Okay. Sure. So really quickly, just a couple of free wellness resources that we have. Obviously, if you would like to see a demo of a portal, we provide free consultations uh, to do a high-level assessment of your firm, as well as walk you through uh, our portal and our app and what, what, from a technology standpoint and programming standpoint, we can provide to your company. We also provide an introductory lunch and learn free of charge that can either be streamed and or in person. We also have access to our blog that provides daily tips and recommendations for very basic lifestyle modifications. Great. Okay, so um, again, that is the end of our main uh, piece here. We do have a few questions that I'll read out to Emily. Um, but while I'm doing that as well, too, again, here's our contact information. Please don't be shy about reaching out to either one of us. We're happy to talk with people. Um, give a, a quick consultation and see if there is where we, either of us could help you or your organization. Um, Emily, the first question that came up is, can you speak on the various incentive strategies you're seeing in organizational wellness programs? Um, are they primarily participation-based, um, outcome-based, progress-based, or a combination? We prefer a combination. Um, we, within our point system, we have points that are associated both with progress and participation. And so I think a blend of the two, a hybrid of the two, actually works best, uh, particularly for those who are really working hard and maybe not seeing the needle move on whatever metric they want or whatever goal that they have set. Every, we're human. We all hit plateaus. So I think that it, participatory uh, points or, or rewards are just as important to sustain engagement and motivation. Are, we're also in the mindset that you can attract more bees with honey. So rather than, than uh, it's better to incentivize an individual rather than quote unquote punish them. So if you want to incentivize, if you want to associate a reward or incentive with the, the amount that, you, that an employer contributes to a, a insurance premium, we recommend rather than saying we're going to increase your premium if you don't participate, rather make a, a, a promotion in which you will actually quote unquote discount their rate rather than increase it if they participate. Great. Um, and also I'd like to point this is another area where um, incentive uh, pieces and things like that don't necessarily need to be just around um, the outcome for the individual or participation of the individual. It could also be around the organization. So for example, if your organization saves you know, 10% or 5% on um, workman's compensation claims or, or health care costs or things like that, um, a portion of that could be distributed back to the employees who helped make it happen um, and who, who got through to that. So it, there are also a lot of questions of that area that you can, you can do. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, I saw an article the other day where a hospital in New Jersey, I believe it was, um, decided to help with some of the cost sharing and savings with the physicians. And by saying, you know, for every dollar that we send, the physicians get get a, a cut of it themselves, um, over the past three years they've been able to, to reduce their costs, I think it was like 9 or 10 percent per year. Um, so it's been very effective to look at it from that perspective as well too. Mm -hmm. um, another question we have is if we're just starting out with wellness, um, where do you recommend we, we start? Uh, back to the whole, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but the crawl before you walk, walk before you run, I would do a slow introduction. Unless you have a very healthy population, it, you probably want to start out with the basics. So, and, and the basics don't have to necessarily just be education of, of flyers and, and weekly e-blasts. You might want to do, rather than bring on the portal or the app, you might want to do a one-time 8 to 12 week team challenge to see what, what the levels of participation are. You might want to bring in a quarterly lunch and learn versus a monthly. So it's just, it's, it's making a slower introduction, a, a, a softer introduction at the beginning before you roll out a robust program. Yep. And, and also, you know, I've seen where organizations can start out with saying we're going to start with one site or one department or one, one group mm -hmm. in our organization. So it doesn't have to be organization wide to get started either prove some results and then roll things out to the larger organization as you get, get success. Correct. That, that's Actually, that's occurring in a couple of our organizations right now. They're starting with 
with one di one division and and with and quite honestly within that one division they have identified early adopters or what we what they're calling visionaries and so we actually are rolling it out to the visionaries prior to the general population within that that division to to create even greater momentum behind what we're about to roll out great that's fantastic uh, and, and the last question that we have so far, um, in case anyone wants to send any out, you still have a couple seconds, um, was how do I convince the powers that be that we need a wellness program? <laughs> um, that's, that's something that's really hard to do. Um, obviously, wellness and health and wellness, uh, they are personal journeys. They are they're personal um, decisions that, that one must come to on their own. But Obviously, you can make the case from from a, a dollar standpoint on on the statistics that are associated with it. Another thing that we have, and this actually speaks more to the CFO, but we have a cost of waiting calculator in which we go into an organization and say, based on the top five most chronic illnesses within the U.S. based on the CDC and the general statistics of, of these chronic illnesses affecting the general population, here is what your cost of waiting is on an organization over the course of a, of a one year time. And those, so that, that calculator, when you calculate it, is pretty staggering based on, on the population that we're talking about. So that's another, that's another motivator. Also, we have a pilot program where we can actually take the C-suite through a three month program themselves so that they can see for themselves the impact on, on, their, on their personal lives. Uh, so there are a couple ways to, to, to get their buy-in, but their buy-in is so critical, we've got to do it some way, either through, through their personal experience or numbers. Great. Okay, thank you. Well, that is uh, all the questions that we have so far. Um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope this was helpful. And again, please don't be shy about reaching out to either Emily or myself. Uh, this session will be up on uh, the Triton's YouTube channel shortly, so please feel free to share it with anyone that you like. Or if you have any questions, just give us a, a shout later. Um, I guess that's about it. Uh, Emily, is there any closing thoughts that you'd like to say? Um, that's it. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, either phone or email, as you see on the screen, and we would welcome the opportunity to answer any questions you have and or meet with you. Great. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye.